Good evening. Um, welcome to this reading from Simon Reynolds. Very bright, all very dark. Oh, that's okay. Uh, rip it up and start again. Post-punk from 1978 to 84. Fantastic book. We're reading from chapter uh, 10. Just step sideways. Dealing with the full Joy Division, Derude's column, a certain ratio, and the whole Manchester scene. And to dip our toes in, I would like to read uh, a couple of sentences about the two worlds that the fall occupied, both the fall of Mancunian cockiness and some shamanism on the other hand. Arrogance as well as maybe the acid informed mysticism. The fall assumed the mantle of perpetual outsiders resisting being assimilated, pigeonholed or explained. In a way, Smith or Marky Smith just added a kind of shamanic edge to what's, what's simply standard issue Mancunian cockiness, itself a sort of folk memory survival from the city's industrial heyday. So let's start this chapter. Just step sideways. We're also talking a little bit about Martin Hannett, The Passage and Factory Records. In the late 70s, the Falls singer Marky e. Smith rode his moped past an industrial estate called Trafford Park en route to his job in Manchester's docks. Legend has it he often passed a young man dressed in the same donkey jacket on his way to work, Ian Curtis, future frontman of Joy Division. It was a bit spooky. They looked quite like each other, recalls Una Baines, Smith's girlfriend at the time and keyboard player in The Fall. Joy Division and The Fall had much else in common. Similar backgrounds, upper working class verging on petit bourgeois, similar education, grammar school, and similar jobs. Smith was a shipping clerk, Curtis and Joy Division's guitarist, Barney Sumner and Peter, ba uh, <laughs> bassist Hook, Peter Hook, did all the clerical work, did all clerical work, excuse me, all did clerical work for the local council. It'd be quite impressive if they did all the clerical work for the local council, just the three members of Joy Division. They loved the same bands too, The Doors, Velvet Underground, The Stooges, Can. Yet, despite rehearsing in the same building and even playing on some bills together, Joy Division and The Fool never acknowledged each other's existence. As if by tacit agreement, they engaged in a taciturn struggle to be the definitive Manchester band of the post-punk era. We never spoke to each other, laughs Martin Brammer, The Fool's guitarist. I think they're great now, but at the time The Fool and Joy Division were definitely contending. Fronted by singers who exuded a shamanic aura, Joy Division and The Fall conveyed a sense of strangeness and estrangement that travels far beyond the specifics of time and place. But it's hard to imagine them coming out from anywhere other than 1970s Manchester. Something about the city's gloom and decay seemed to seep deep into the fabric of, the very, of their very different sounds. Although he didn't identify the place by name, Smith immortalised the pollution belching Trafford Park on Industrial Estate, an early fall classic. The crap in the air will fuck up your face, he jeers. That song is a very funny take on Manchester's history of having been the cradle of capitalism and then, by the 1970s, its grave, says Richard Boone, who funded the recording of the fall's first EP, but then couldn't afford to release it on New Hormones. Grim Beyond Belief is how John Savage describes his first impressions of Manchester as a Londoner relocating there in 1978. Even today, after a redevelopment boom, boom, the bleakness endures in pockets. A partial facelift has dotted the city centre with flashy designer wine bars and slick corporate off offices, but the old 19th century architecture abides. Sombre, imposing edifices testifying to the pride and deep pockets of Manchester's self-made industrial barons. The dark red brickwork seems to soak up what scant daylight emanates from the typically slate grey skies. Venture outside the town centre and the city's past as world capital of mechanised cotton and manufacture becomes more evident. Railway viaducts, canals of the colour of lead, converted warehouses and factories, and cleared lots littered with masonry shards and refuse.
By the 1970s, the world's first industrial city had become one of the first to enter the post-industrial era. The wealth had evaporated, but the desolate, denatured environment persisted. Attempts to renovate only made matters worse. As in other cities across the UK, urban planners dem demolished the old Victorian terraced housing. Long-established working-class communities were broken up and the slum residents forcibly rehoused in what soon turned out to be laboratories of social atomization, high-rise blocks and council estates. For Una Baines, this redevelopment figures as a kind of primal trauma. She remembers, my mum, quote, crying on the corner of the street when they knocked down our row of houses in Collyhurst. Frank Owen of the Manchester post-punk outfit Manicured Noise fulminates. Those planners should be hung for what they did. They did more damage to Manchester than the German bombers did in World War II, and all under the guise of benevolent social democracy. In the pre-punk 70s, Manchester seemed to have all the bad aspects of urban life. Pollution, eyesore architecture, all enveloping dreariness, with barely any of its subcultural compensations. There really was nothing going on until punk, recalls Boone. The industry was dying, the clothes were dreadful, the hair was awful. Manchester's starved souls grabbed for whatever stimulus or sparkle they could find. Fashion, books, esoteric music, drugs. The fall didn't go, much in, go in much for style. Scrawny, lank-haired, and typically wearing a scruffy pullover of indeterminate hue, Smith looked like a grown-up version of the runty school kid in yet in Kes, Kes, Ken Loach's 1969 film. But the fall were mad for the other three escape routes, literature, music, and illegal substances. In its earliest incarnation, the Fall resembled a poetry group more than a rock band. They'd hung out at Baines's flat and read their scribblings to one another. We all wrote words then, not just Mark, recalled Brammer, or recalls Brammer. Although they would have spurned the word intellectual, too close to the despised world of students and higher education, that's what the four original members of the Fall were, working class intellectuals, bookworms really, making good use of their library cards, devouring everything from Burroughs to Dick to Yeats and Camus. Their name came from the latter's novel The Fall, which bassist Tony Friel happened to be reading. As for music, the Fall preferred what Smith called the real heavy stuff, drug music mostly, but not the blissed out pastoralism or, buff comic or cosmic buffoonery. Instead, the Fall tranced out to the primal monotony of Can, the methadrine scorched white noise of Velvet Underground and 60s punkadelic bands like The Seeds, who had just one keyboard riff, which they endlessly recycled. This is the three R's, repetition, 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 quipped Smith on the Fool's mission statement, repetition. Scorning fancy music, the overpriced mainstream rock of the day, repetition fulfilled Smith's early goal of raw music with really weird vocals on top. The rawness was supplied by Brammer's thin, weedling guitar lines, Baines's wonky organ jabs, played on the cheap and nasty Snoopy keyboard, rated by sounds as the absolute worst on the market, Friel's capering bass, and Carl Burns' ramshackle drums. The freak vocal element came from Smith's half-sung, half-spoken drawl and wizened insolence. In an early interview, Smith describes the fall as head music with energy. Head meaning not cerebral or anti-dance, but the 60s idea of a head, someone into turning on and tripping out. Manchester had a strong underground drug culture, not so much a 1960s hangover, said Brammer, as the true if slightly belated arrival of the 60s in the early 70s. We learned from people older than us, like John Cooper Clarke, the Manchester poet who lived in the same area as us, Prestwich. He was 10 years older, from the 60s really. We were the next generation. We saw all the hippies who'd blown their brains out and we felt we were wiser than that, but still attracted to the drug experience. 
circa 1973, a few years before the group existed as a musical entity, 16-year-old Marky e. Smith used to take acid and go around clubs wearing swastika armbands, a proto-punk gesture of pure provocation rather than an indication of fascist sympathies. Brammer recalls being given microdots and the next day going to Heaton Park, this stately home, quotes, that is the nearest thing Manchester has to a common where we dropped the acid and spent the whole day tripping, end quote. Later, they discovered that Heathford, Heaton Park was renowned among local heads for its psilocybin mushrooms. Quotes, they were just fields of them you could pick, and it was a totally free source of entertainment, says Brammer. From then on, we were kind of pickled in mushrooms and LSD, really exploring music and discovering ourselves. Amphetamines also made their mark on the fall. Speed stoked the group's attitude. Smith's searing, see-through-you gaze, the icy arrogance and it shaped the sound, the white lightning rush of discords. Smith sounds like someone speed rapping, the words spat out with an oracular urgency, encrypted but mesmerising. High doses of speed create a kind of eureka sensation. The user feels he's accessed a truth invisible to others and can... He's a truth invisible to others can see occult connections. On Live at the Witch Trials, the group's 1979 debut, Underground Medicine and Frightened evoke the pos pos positive and negative side uh, sides of amphetamine abuse. The rush that lights up your nervous system. I found a reason not to die, Smith exults. The spark inside. Versus the hypertense twitchiness of stimulant-induced paranoia. In 1981, Smith talked about the downside of taking a lot of speed over a long period. You start looking in mirrors and getting ulcers. But the fool carried on writing songs like Totally Wired and covering 60s amphetamine hymn, hymns like Mr. Pharmacist. The pharmacist in that song is a drug dealer, a street punk peddling energy. The four were obsessed with the double standards surrounding drugs, the way some chemicals are prescribed while others are proscribed. Training in a psychiatric training as a psychiatric nurse at Prestwich Hospital, Baines came back every day from work and disgorged stories about the mistreatment and neglect she had witnessed, including the use of downers to pacify the inmates. Her talk filtered into Smith's lyrics. Repetition refers to electroshock therapy. After you've had some, alleges Smith, you lose your love of repetition. While the Fool's 1979 single Rausch Rumble got its title from Hoffman La Roche, the pharmaceutical multinational who dominated the market for antidepressants. Drugs of the socially sanctioned kind flooded Manchester in the 70s. And if you get a bit of depression, ask the doctor for some Valium, Smith taunts on industrial estates. Numbing and often incapacitating tranquilizers were massively overprescribed to help ordinary people. Menopausal housewives, troubled teenagers, wage slaves, cracked by stress and boredom, not so much manage as be manageable. In an area like Hume, Hume, Hulme, Hume, now infamous crescents were apparent whose infamous crescents were a paradigm of the 1960s housing project gone wrong. Antidepressants were dispensed so freely, some quarter of a million tablets in 1977 alone, that they verged on a form of social control. At the same time, Hume illustrated the double standards concerning drugs that Smith captured in the title Underground Medicine. The crescents were also where most of Manchester's bathtub speed was manufactured. Pills feature in Bingo Masters' Breakout, the title track of the Fool's debut EP, not as a way of coping with soul-crushing mundanity, but of escaping it permanently. A guy whose job is organising other people's recreation, the Bingo Master, looks into his future and seeing only encroaching boldness and years of wasting time in numbers and rhyme, opts to end his life with a handful of pills washed down with booze. Smith had visited a bingo hall with his parents and been stunned by how regimented and mechanical the fun was. The evening's mind-dulling entertainment formed a grim mirror image to the daytime soul-destroying labour. It wasn't like a place you'd go for your leisure. It was a glorified works canteen, Smith told Sounds. 
and people were going there straight from work. Macabre and hilarious, Bingo Masters Breakout typifies the fall's peculiar brand of social surrealism. Brammer described the band's songs as Coronation Street on acid. It was us sitting in pubs, munching magic mushrooms and observing the daft things people did. In the grand tradition of British misanthropic satire, Smith's invective seems to come from somewhere outside the class system, a vantage point from which everything seemed equally absurd. The privileged upper class and middle management bourgeoisie with their pretensions, pretensions and illusions for sure, but also the proles with their inverted snobbery, escapist pleasures and grumbling acquiescence to the way things are and ever shall be. And unsparing towards his, as unsparing towards his own people as everybody else, Smith's withering gaze scanned the whole of society and found only grotesquerie. In many ways, he resembled the judge penitent of Camus the Fool, who weighs up everybody's feelings, failings and hypocrisies, his own included. In the song New Puritan, Smith declared, our decadent sins will reap discipline. In the early days, the Fool were regarded as heavy duty politicos. Songs like Hey Fascist and Race Hatred got them briefly tagged as new wave commies. A misunderstanding partly based on the fact that their bassist Friel uh, had once been a member of the Young Communist League. But Baines says she and Smith did attend loads of political meetings, things like the international Marxists. We were never members, just interested in checking out the range of opinions. Baines was also a forthright feminist who'd rejected her Catholic upbringing while still at her all-girls school because the Bible was so anti-woman. There was a lot going on in Manchester with feminism then. The first rape crisis centres and women's refuges, abortion rights were hotly fought for and we were right in the middle for that, or of that. In 1977-8, The Fall played numerous Rock Against Racism benefits, but like many post-punk groups, they became disenchanted with uh, rock, and ra rock Against Racism's treatment of music as a mere vehicle for politicising youth. Soon they distanced themselves from anything remotely resembling agitprop or right-on trendy excuse me, leftism. Instead, Smith developed a way of writing about the real world that was increasingly elliptical and non-linear. Equally important as subject matter was rock culture. Song after song skewered the platitudes and pieties of hipsters. It's the new thing. Music scene. Mere sued mag ed. Look now. Print head. The last about an obsessive music press reader who gets dirty fingers every week perusing the inkies. In interview and song alike, Smith took on the role of meta pop spectre, stalking the periphery of the post-punk scene and maintaining a scathing running commentary on the failings of the Fool's peer groups. One of his most famous pronouncements was his description of the fool themselves as northern white crap that talks back in Crap Rap 2 from Witch Trials. It recaptures the basic fool stance of surly intransigence. I don't fully understand it myself, Smith admits to sounds. It's meant to be like mystical. The fool assumed the mantle of perpetual outsiders, resisting being assimilated, pigeonholed or explained. In a way, Smith just added a kind of shamanic edge to what's simply standard issue Mancunian cockiness. Itself a sort of folk memory surviving from the city's industrial heyday when Manchester kept all the machinery going for the rest of humanity or for the rest of the country. As Baines put it, being proud of the city's industrial might, though, didn't mean you sided with the factory boss quite the opposite. Throughout the 19th century, Manchester was a stronghold for working class radicalism, from the machinery wrecking Luddites to the vote demanding Chartists. The co-author author of the Communist Manifesto, Friedrich Engels, lived in Manchester for a time and wrote the conditions of the condition of the working class in England, England after observing the textile industry. Punishing work in hostile conditions forged a kind of spiritual metal 
indomitable, tough as new nails. Fiery Jack, the fall's fourth single, offered a coruscating portrait of one of Manchester's finest sons, the hard-bitten product of five generations of industrial life. Fiery Jack is a 45-year-old pub stalwart who spent three decades on the piss, ignoring the pain from his long-suffering kidneys. Surviving on meat pies and other revolting bar snacks, Jack is an inexhaustible font of anecdotes and rants. The music sounds stubborn, incorrigible, a white line crush, a white line rush of rockabilly drums and rhythm guitar like sparks shooting out of a severed cable. Speed might just be another of Jack's poisons, judging by his refusal to go back to the slow life and lines like, too fast to write, I just burn, burn, burn. Based on other blokes Smith had met in Manchester pubs, Jack was the sort of guy I could see myself uh, is the sort of guy I can see myself as in, excuse me, Jack was the sort of guy I can see myself as in 20 years, he told Sounds. These old guys have more guts than the kids will ever have. Jack was the lad who, who grew old, battered by hard work and harder pleasure, but who never gave up and never gave in. Joy Division began life as Warsaw, to most contemporary ears a fairly undistinguished punk-inflected hard rock band. But if you listen to the early demos and strain your ears, you can hear a metallic gleam of difference, metal in both the serrated and the Black Sabbath senses of the word. Digital, and I really recommend you go and have a listen to this if you haven't already, it's in the description. It's fantastic. The drumming is phenomenal. The group's first recording, Digital as Joy Division, that is, the song is called Digital. Uh, the first recording of Joy Division sounds not a million miles from Sabbath's Paranoid, a dark, fast pummel, a full tilt dirge fusing pace and ponderousness. Sabbath's Bill Ward claimed that most people, quote, on a living, on a permanent down, excuse me, po most people live on a permanent down, but just aren't aware of it. We're trying to express it for the people. It's a really nice quote. I'm going to read it again. It's Bill Ward from Black Sabbath, who said, Most people live on a permanent down, but just aren't aware of it. We're trying to express it for the people. <clears throat> Ian Curtis's harrowed voice and words offer, offered an equally heavy vision of life. Look at his lyrics and certain words and images appear repeatedly. Coldness, pressure, darkness, crisis, failure, collapse, loss of control. There are numberless scenarios of futile exertion, exertion, purposes turn sour and doom closing in. Above all, there are terminal words, endless ends and finals. But Joy Division's reference points were less lumpen than heavy metals. Not pulp super superhero comics or bastardised blues, but J.G. Ballard and Bowie's Low, or Bowie's Low. Rather than the invulnerable Iron Man, Barney Sumner's guitar evokes the wounded, penetrable ma metal of crash, twisted, buckled, splayed, torn. Joy Division's originality really became apparent once they slowed down. Shedding punk's fast, distortion-thickened sound, the music grew stark and sparse. Hook's bass carries the melody. Sumner's guitar leaves gaps rather than fills the mix with dense riffage. And Steve Morris's drums seem to circle the rim of a crater. Curtis intones from a lonely place at the centre of this empty expanse. All that space in Joy Division's music was something critics immediately noticed. It would have been hard to miss, even if Curtis hadn't put up signposts in the middle of title, titles like Interzone, or lyrical references to No Man's Land. The group's original name was inspired by Varsava, a haunting instrumental on the side two of Low. If you haven't heard this and you want to feel miserable, go ahead. It's like listening to a rainy day. Like the word Berlin, Warsaw also appealed because of its World War II and Cold War connotations. 
the uprising of the Jewish ghetto, the raising of the old city, and the fabulous desolation of a city rebuilt rapidly after the war. All Spartan tower blocks, government ministries straight out of Orwell's 1984, and, dis and disquietingly wide streets designed to allow Soviet tanks to roll down them should the need arise. The band's new name had even more dismal resonance. It came from House of Dolls, a 1965 novel written by a concentration camp survivor who took his pen name Kartsetnik 135633 from the prisoner number branded on his arm. The novel is written from the point of view of a 14-year-old girl sent to Auschwitz's camp labour via joy. The joy division where females were kept as sex slaves for German troops on leave from the Russian front. You can argue, as Steve Morris does, that the name indicated in identification excuse me, with, the, which, with the victims rather than their tormentors. It was the flip side of it, rather than being the master race, the oppressed rather than the oppressor. You can also talk, as Barney Sumner has, about the group being preoccupied with keeping alive memories of World War II, the sacrifices of their parents' and grandparents' generations in the struggle of good against evil. Still, Joy Division's use of Nazi imagery stemmed at least as much from morbid fascination and, as such, was often in questionable taste. On the mini-album Short Circuit, Live at the Electric Circus, a document of the Manchester punk scene, Curtis can be heard screaming at the crowd. Do you all remember Rudolf Hess? In June 1978, the group self-released their first record, the Warsaw EP, An Ideal for Living. The sleeve featured a drawing of a blonde-haired Hitler youth drummer boy and a photograph of a German stormtrooper pointing a gun at a small Polish Jewish boy. In the early days, Sumner used the Germanic-sounding stage name Albrecht and the, the group's name excuse me, the group's image, grey shirts, very short hair, thin ties, had a monochrome austerity and discipline redolent of totalitarianism. At a time when neo-Nazis were marching through the streets of Britain's major cities, when racial attacks were on the rise, some believed that any ambiguity in one's allegiances were irresponsible. Morris says the flack the group received. We knew we weren't Nazis, but we kept on getting letters in the enemy, slating us for harbouring Eichmann in the coal cellar. Just encouraged us to keep on going, because that's the kind of people we are. But the flirtations went a little further than just a perverse joke. Years later, Hook and Sumner talked candidly about the fascination of fascism. Sumner enthused about how, out of all that hate and all that dominance, shone forth the beauty of the art, the architecture, the design, even the uniforms. Hook admitted the dark allure of a certain physical sensation you get from flirting with something that like that. We thought it was a very we thought it was a very, very strong feeling. Curtis's obsession with Germany, according to his wife Deborah, their wedding featured a hymn sung to the tune of the German national anthem, stemmed partly from the Berlin chic of his glam heroes, Reed, Pop and Bowie. He was also intrigued by the mass psychology of fascism, the way a charismatic leader could bewitch an entire population into doing or accepting irrational and monstrous things. The early song Walked in Line is about those who, di who just did what they were told, committing crimes in a hypnotic trance. An explorer of literature's darker precincts such as Conrad and Kafka, Curtis simply enjoyed contemplating humanity's bottomless capacity for inhumanity. He also shared Una Baines' obsession with psychiatric disor disorders. One of his relatives worked in a mental home and brought back grim stories, while Curtis himself worked, briefly worked in a rehabilitation centre for people with mental or physical disabilities. As Deborah Curtis mordantly observed in her memoir, it struck me that all Ian's spare time was reading and thinking about human suffering. Curtis's doomy baritone and obsession with the dark side often got him compared to Jim Morrison, Indeed, The Doors were one of the singer's favourite bands. 
Joy Division's shadow play is like L.A. woman turned inside out, the latter's rolling virile propulsion reduced to a bleak transit across a city that could hardly be less like sun-baked Southern California. Gaping yet claustrophobic, if there's two words to sum up Joy Division, gaping but claustrophobic, how fantastic is that? Joy Division space is the opposite of the utopian kind you find in 60s rock. The freeway is frontier imagery and explode into space euphoria of Steppenwolf's Born to be Wild, the outward bound cosmic surge of Pink Floyd and Hendrix. All that space in Joy Division's music needed room to breathe. Playing small clubs, they were a bit of a racket, says John Keenan, the Leeds promoter behind Futurama festivals of, of post-punk music behind the Futurama festivals of post-punk music. But the next time I saw them in a big hall with a bit of echo, it suddenly made sense. They weren't a club band, they were meant to play stadiums. As Factory Records' house producer, Martin Hannett dedicated himself to capturing and intensifying Joy Division's eerie spatiality. Punk records typically stimulated the boxy, in-your-face sound of small club gigs. The fast tempos and fuzzed out guitars suited the tinny, two-dimensional sound reproduction of the 7-inch single. Music for teenagers with their transistor radios and cheap record players, as opposed to adults with proper stereo systems. But Hannett believed punk was sonically conservative precisely because its refusal to exploit the, the recording studio's capacity to create space. Have a listen again to D, uh, uh, Digital, the song mentioned in the description by Joy Division. Uh, a friend of mine said the end of that song, the re re reverb produced, is, is like it's going into a funnel. He, we, he listened to it over and over again, telling me how amazing this reverb is. It's well worth having a listen to just the final clip of that song. Factory Records' is Tony Wilson talked of Hannett's genius in terms of synesthesia. He could see sound, shape it, rebuild it. This really visual sense that most people just don't have was enhanced by Hannett's being a major spliffhead. Hash, he told one interviewer, is good for the ears. Like John Cooper Clarke, with whom he worked, Hannett was a 60s character, fan of psychedelia and dub. He also adored the psychogeography excuse me, of urban space, talking about how deserted public places, empty office blocks, give me a rush. Digital, Hannett's first Joy Division production, was titled after his favourite sonic toy, the AMS Digital uh, Delay Line. Hannett used the AMS and other digital effects coming onto the market in the late 70s to achieve ambience control. He could wrap a song or individual instruments within a track inside a particular spatial aura, as if they came from imaginary rooms with real seeming dimensions and sound reflections. Hannett talked of creating sonic holograms through layering sounds and reverbs. His most distinctive use of the AMS digital delay was subtle, though. He applied a microsecond delay to the drums that was barely audible, which, but which created a sense of enclosed space, a vaulted sound, like the music was recorded in a mausoleum. Hannett also wove subliminal shimmers deep into the recesses of Joy Division's records, as, and he loved the occasional extreme effect. On the debut, Unknown Pleasures, he mic'd up the clanking of an antique lift for insight and incorporated Smashing Glass on I Remember Nothing. In a reversal of the super slick 70s mega rock way of doing things, the mega rock way of doing things, overdubs galore, overdubs galore musicians recorded separately and then re reunited at the mixing desk. <clears throat> Punk bands were often recorded playing together in real time. Hannett took it back to the other way to an extreme degree. He demanded totally clean and clear sound separation, not just for individual instruments, but each element of the drum kit. Typically on tracks he considered to be potential singles, he'd get me to play each drum on its own to avoid any bleed through of sound. And this is said by um, uh, Morris, the, the drummer. First the bass drum, then the snare part, then the hi-hats. Not only was this tediously protracted, it created a, kind, created a mechanistic disjointed effect. 
the natural way to play drums is all at the same time. So I'd end up with my legs black and blue because I'd be tapping them on, tapping on them quietly to do the other bits of the kit that he wasn't recording. This dehumanizing treatment, essentially turning Morris into a drum machine, was typical of Hannett's rather high-handed attitude to, to musicians. But the disjointedness certainly added to the music's alienated feel. You can hear it on one of the high points of the Hannett Joy Division partnership. She's lost control with its Meccano disco drum loop, tom toms like ball bearings, and a bass line like steel cable undulating in strict time, and a guitar like a contained explosion, as the as if the track's only real rock out element has been cordoned off. Hannett loved to play mind games with musicians to create tension. On one occasion, he forced Morris to dismantle his entire drum kit because of an unwanted rattling sound, which Hannett may have Im imagined or simply invented. It's these kinds of mind games which also recall Marky Smith's treatment of his band, sort of internal bullying to increase the tension of the sound. Sometimes he'd go to sleep under the desk to create a state of panic, Chris Nagel, the studio engineer on Unknown Pleasures and the singles transmission and atmosphere, has said. Then he'd just impose his will on people and they'd, and they'd go back to the, to the studio really wound up. Nagel's diabetes became another weapon for Hannett. He'd turn the studio air conditioning to its coldest setting, supposedly for the engineer's benefit. We'd literally be shivering at the back, says Morris. Hannett wanted to discourage the musicians from sticking around after they'd laid down their parts so he could have free reign with the material. But the Arctic temperature in Strawberry Studios seems to have seeped into Joy Division's music. You can almost see Curtis's breath forming condensation in the cold air. At the time, Joy Division hated what Hannett did to their music. Unknown pleasures sounded drained and emaciated to their ears. They'd rather have had something closer to the full-on assault of their live performances. But on the album, Hannett used one of his favourite devices, the Marshall Time Modulator, to suppress the guitars and other big instruments. It just made things sound smaller, says Morris. A big tom-tom riff of mine could come out sounding like coconuts being hit with matchsticks. Yet without this denuded production, unknown pleasures would not have such a strikingly wintry soundscape. Released at the height of the British summer of British summertime, June 1979, the album caught the eye as well as the ear. The cover, designed by Factory's art director Peter Saville, was a matte black void apart from the small scientific diagram of rippling lines whose crinkled crests and sharp slopes resemble the outlines of a mountain range. Barney Sumner had found the diagram in, Cam in the Cambridge Encyclopedia of Science. It's a Fourier analysis of 100 consecutive light spasms emitted by the pulsar CP1919, left behind when a massive sun exhausts its fuel and collapses in on itself. A pulsar is hi is highly electromagnetic and emits regular flashes of intense energy, like a lighthouse in the pitch black night. Perhaps that's how Kurt Ian Curtis was beginning to see himself as a magnetic, magnetic star sending out a signal, a beacon in the darkness. And could he have known that pulsars belong to a distinct class of heavenly bodies known as misanthropic or isolated neutron stars? People gradually started to tune into the signal. The slow-burning success, success of Unknown Pleasures and the hypnotic single Transmission gave Joy Division an increasingly obsessive following, nicknamed the Cult with No Name, and according to stereotype, consisting of intense young men dressed in grey overcoats. Joy Division understood the power and attraction of Mystique from the start. Some text of An Ideal for Living declared, This is not a concept EP, it is an enigma. The band's refusal to do interviews, after some early bad experiences, only enhanced their aura. The cult expanded through the second half of 1979 as Joy Division played steadily more prestigious gigs. In August, they headlined the Lee Festival, a collaboration between Factory and its Liverpool counterpart, Zoo. In September, they were headliners for one night of John Keenan's Futurama Festival. In the last months of the year, of the year they supported and upstaged Buzzcocks on the latter's UK tour. Atmosphere, Joy Division's 
Division's breathtaking next single would surely have given the group their first hit in March 1980 if it had come out on Factory. Instead, they gave it to the obscure, ultra-arty French label Sordide Sentimental, who, or Sordid Sentimental, who released it as a tiny limited edition under the title Licht und Blindheit. With its vast drumscape, vast, with its vast drumscape, permafrost synths, and cascading rich chimes, atmosphere sounds like nothing else in rock except maybe some dream collaboration between Nico, Nico and Phil Spector. The image on the original Sordid Sentimental release, a hooded monk, his back turned to the viewer, stalking a snow-covered alpine peak, captures the, re- the moments when a certain religiosity began to gather around Joy Division. Possessed is how a, the normally dry and sardonic Hannett described Curtis in an interview with John Savage. It was with me, it was me who said, touched by the hand of God, to a Dutch magazine. He was one of those channels for the Gestalt, the, one, the only one I bumped into in that period, a lightning conductor. You don't need to wax lyrical, wax mystical, though, to see Curtis as a seer-like figure whose private pain somehow worked as a prism for the wider culture, refracting the malaise and anguish of Britain in the dying days of the 70s. That private pain was mundanely specific, though. Grown-up problems like a failing marriage, adultery and illness. Curtis had fallen out of love with his wife just as they were having their first child. He'd also become embroiled in an affair with a glamorous, demanding Belgian woman called Annick Honor. And as if that was not enough, he was also having to deal with epilepsy. Strangely, he'd been dancing on stage in a twitchy, convulsive style that resembled an epileptic fit for some time before he suffered his first attack in December 1978. Was he somehow able to channel a latent form of this electrical disorder of the nervous system and transform it into his performance signature? Or Or did the dance precipitate the condition? Both Deborah Curtis and Barney Sumner recalls Curtis becoming friendly with an epileptic girl at the rehabilitation centre where he worked. The inspiration for She's Lost Control, she later died during a fit. No one knows why Curtis became epileptic, but it's clear that the heavy duty tranquilizers prescribed to, to control the condition, downers like phenobar- phenobarbitone, and carbamazepine clouded his mind, sapped his spirits, and made him even more vulnerable to the guilt and confusion caused by his infidelity. Hardly surprising then, was such a pall hanging over the lead singer, that a strange social climate, as Hannett put it, surrounded the March 1980 sessions for Closer, Joy Division's second album. Hannett describes the record, described the record as cabalistic, locked in its own mysterious world. Summoner recalled staying up all night, sometimes sleeping in the control room, because at night you get a weirder atmosphere. Compared with Unknown Pleasures, the textures of Closer are more ethereal and experimental. Peter Hook often used a six-string bass for more melody, while Summoner built a couple of synthesizers from kits. Morris had acquired a drum, sound, a drum synth and fed it through the shittiest fuzz pedal you can imagine. To generate the slaughterhouse of hacking and shearing, metal on bone noise in the background of the atrocity exhibition, Closer's opener. In typically repressed British manner, neither Hannett nor Curtis's own bandmates were able to talk to the singer about his problems. Yet eerily, they appear to have absorbed his pain and recreated it sonically. Listening, it's like you are invited inside his head. Excuse me, it's like you are inside his head, feeling the awful downswirling drag of terminal depression. Side one is all agony, the swarming knives of atrocity, the ice shrouded gaze of isolation, Curtis swathed in barbiturate haze, his voice mineralized by Hannett's effects. The treadmill motion of Passover sounds like the group's batteries are running down. It's followed by the tough, punitive rock of Colony and A Means to an End, on which the drums finally decelerate to a di- like a dying machine. Close's second side is even more disturbing, but this time on account of its serenity. It's as, as though Curtis has stopped struggling altogether. 
the numb trance and narcotics narcotic glide of heart and soul the alternately desperate and resigned 24 hours it's beautiful bass like the pulse of a heavy heart curtis's voice disconcertingly deep like the microphone like the mi microphone is right inside his chest the epic colonnades of uh, columnades of the eternal seen through misty eyes as if curtis is watching his own funeral proce procession finally the listless clip-clop beat of decades its synths eroded and washed out like aged or aged super eight home movies of happy childhood memories curtis wrote his lyrics in a trance-like state with no editing or rewriting there are allusions to the dead marriage quote a va valueless collection of hopes and past desires the sound from broken homes to the dislocations and the crushing sense of failure quote i'm ashamed of the things i've been put through I'm ashamed of the person I am. Most of all, there's fatigue. According to Sumner, Curtis blatant, blatantly told him, I feel like there's a big whirlpool and I'm being sucked into it, down into it, and there's nothing I can do. The barbiturates Curtis was taking for his epilepsy were like little doses of death, freezing him from the inside. The barbs changed people's personalities, said fellow factory artist Vinnie Riley, who had his own psychological problems and bonded with Curtis in this period. You lose your sense of reality. That's what's happened. And he, that's what happened. And he got further and further out. And so far out, he couldn't get back. Songs like Isolation and The Eternal come from the same lifeless emotional landscapes as Nico's Desert Shore and the Marble Index, cut off from the warm-blooded mainland of human contact and fellowship. The last lyric Curtis ever finished, In a Lonely Place, featured a death wish reference to caressing the marble and stone. Reviewers of Closer picked up on this sense of the singer as already interred buried alive in the blues. Sounds as David McCulloch praised Hammett's production as the oral equivalent of a rich marble slab. In the gap between finishing Closer and its release in Ju July 1980, Curtis had already attempted suicide with an overdose of pills. On top of everything else, he was depressed by his worsening epilepsy, which interfered with his ability to fulfil his role in the band. On one occasion, he had to leave the stage after suffering an attack. Simon Topping, from an olfactory band, a certain ratio, took his place, but there was still an audience riot. The doctor was telling him the only way to control epilepsy is to live a really quiet life, says Hook. No drink, no drugs, no excitement. And here was the singer in a band that was getting really big. Despite Curtis's overdose and his illness, no real attempts were made to reduce the band's workload. Joy Division's first American tour was in the pipeline. Curtis told some people that he wanted to take time off, but in front of his band bandmates, he feigned excitement. He didn't want to disappoint his comrades or Factory. By this point, the label was essentially carried by the band. At Factory's big London showcase at the Moonlight in April 1980, Joy Division played all three nights. They were the big pool that would, that would get people in to see the label's roster of lesser lights. Yet he must have had severe doubts about being an icon. In the Atrocity exhibition, he alternates between being the ringmaster of the horror show and the freak entertainment itself, prostituting his own neurosis and twitching his body on stage. The crisis came on the 18th of May, 1980. After visiting his estranged wife and asking unsuccessfully for her to drop the divorce, he stayed up all night, watching a movie by his favourite director, Werner Herzog, and listening to Iggy's The Idiot. Finally, he hung himself as that awful daylight in a lonely place approached. Curtis's suicide at the age of 23 made for instant myth. The sheer commitment to the act confirmed the authenticity of Joy Division's words and music in a way that was quite problematic, entirely logical and ultimately inevitable. As Curtis always intended, he joined the pantheon of those who lived too intensely and felt too deeply to make it, it, to make it for long in this world of half measures and settling for less. Brushing away the tears, 
factory threw itself enthusiastically into building and burnishing the legend. Savile gave the posthumous single Love Will Tear Us Apart an exquisite abstract cover that looked like the lustrous stone interior of a cenotaph. His closest sleeve actually featured a photograph taken in a Genoa cemetery, a sculpted tableau of the dead Christ surrounded by grief-stricken mourners. Love Will Tear Us Apart became Joy Division's first chart hit. Curtis's crooning vocal, Hook's bass and Sumner's keyboard trance trace in unison the same shy, crestfallen melody, while Mo Morris's drumming skitters with feathery unrest. On Love Will Tear Us Apart and its savage B-side these days, the singer and the music both sound raw and exposed, like they've got no skin. The words are laceratingly candid glimpses into a dying relationship, snapshots of bad sex and broken trust. Although the marriage breakup was only one factor, Love Will Tear Us Apart was taken as Curtis's suicide note to the public, the official explanation. Marky Smith once suggested that there were two kinds of factory in Manchester, the kind that makes dead men and the kind that lives off a dead man. An unfair jibe, but it's true in the, in the sense that Curtis's death sealed factory stature forever. It also condemned to la the label to struggle for years to find a group as weighty and, and as epochal or epochal as Joy Division. The two closest contenders on Factory's early roster, A Certain Ratio and Deruti Column, weren't close to being in the same league. Tony Wilson came up with the name Deruti, Col Deruti Column on behalf of guitarist Vinnie Riley. Buenaventura Deruti had led a nom nomadic brigade of revolutionaries during the Spanish Civil War, and Wilson was fond of a situationist comic book called The Return of the Deruti Column. which invoked the Catalonian anarchists' guerrilla spirit. The military illusion could hardly have been more incongruous for Riley's fragile music, intricate skeins of guitar, or skeins of guitar, fed through an echoplex and always played with the fingertips, delicate and prismatic, like Jack Frost on a window pane. Far from being a soldier, Riley had gone AWOL from normal life. He suffered from anorexia nervosa, and his music sounded as translucent as you'd expect from someone with almost no flesh. On the second Deruti Column album, 1981's LC, Riley recorded a tribute to Ian Curtis, but the song, Missing Boy, could just as easily, easily be in about himself. It also recalls the chapter on Scottish post-punk and discussions of Joseph, or Joseph Kay, whose singer was also um, maybe not anorexic, but extremely, extremely thin. A certain ratio played funk noir, strongly influenced by the pop group whom they'd, been support, whom they'd seen supporting Per Ubu in 1978. ACR, a certain ratio, received a big boost when they recruited a drummer who was just as talented as Bruce Smith. Donald Johnson's fatback drumming almost single-handedly prevented the group's nebulous sound from wafting off into the void. Heard best on the early single Flight and the live side of the graveyard and the ballroom, a certain ratio's music worked through the tension between dry funk, rimshot cracks and feverish snares, neurotic bass, itchy rhythm guitar, and dank atmospherics. That's a really, really nice way of summing up a certain ratio again. I'll just read that again. It's sort of a tension between dry funk and dank atmospherics. Trumpet that seems to drift through frog. Diffuse smears of guitars so heavily processed it sounds more like synth. At times, a certain ratio sounded like Joy Division getting on the good foot. Singer Simon Topping more or less cloned Curtis's baritone drone, while the lyrics hinted at dark drives through and shadowy states of consciousness. ACR, or certain ratio, had a bizarre sense of fashion. Close cropped hair, baggy khaki shorts, recalls Manchester pop historian David Haslam. This look vaguely redolent of colonialism or the Africa Corps or Corps led to accusations of flirting with fascism, a morbid preoccupation that Topping also shared with Curtis. Still, the presence of a black man behind the drum kit helped to counteract a certain ratio's faintly dubious honour or aura, sorry. For a while, they were Factory's best hope of matching Joy Division's impact. Under the new name New Order, Hook and Sumner and Morris 
were still struggling to establish a direction out of the darkness that had claimed Curtis. Unconsciously, labels seemed, seemed to sign bands that closely resembled their most successful act. And Factory's roster was crowded with Joy Division outf influenced outfits like Section 25 and Crispy Ambulance. Their weak attempts to establish their own identity were further enfeebled by being given the trademark factory sound courtesy of Martin Hamnett. Sorry, Hannett. The latter, meanwhile, sank into heroin addiction, but still managed to do some of his best work as one half of the Invisible Girls, supplying the music for the, man for the genius Mancunian po punk poet John Cooper Clark on albums like Snap Crackle and Bop. As the city's top indie, Factory dominated Manchester's post-punk scene. The main alternative came from a cluster of activity around an organisation called Manchester Music Collective, which was the brainchild of experimental mu musicians Trevor Wishart and Don Witt, or Trevor Wishart, one of Wilson's colleagues at Granada TV. Using a grant from the regional branch of the Arts Council, Wishart and Wits hired a basement in the posh, posh King Street and turned it into a Monday night showcase. The Fall played their first gig there, and Joy Division were regular um, MMC, let me just get that, Manchester Music Collective participants. It gave us somewhere to play. We met other musicians, talked, swapped ideas, Ian Curtis told Enemy. It also gave us a chance to experiment in front of people, Richard Boone recalls. The Manchester Music Musicians Collective, or oh sorry, Manchester Music Collective was a great intervention. There was a whole stream of funny little groups who shared equipment, dislocation dance, gay animals, the hamsters, and a bunch of, of groups on the object music label, like Spherical Objects, Grow Up, and Dick Witt's own group, The Passage. The Passage gave Joy Division a close run for their money at one point, with a string of independent chart hits like LP, Degenerates. Their debut, Pin Drop, was hailed by Paul Morley in The Enemy as a post-punk classic, comparable to Unknown Pleasures. Grappling with the grand themes of love, power and fear in atmospheric, doom-laden music. Formerly a classically trained percussionist, percussionist Wits built dense, dramatic arrangements that were stirringly rhythmical, but not in the least rock-like. We used bell sounds, military sounds like trumpet fanfares, brass and trumpets, anything that suggested things outside rock, he says. Matching the epic sound was the thematic loftiness verging on the didactic. Devils and angels railed against organised religion, while XOYO obliquely explored gender politics. Wits had originally formed the passage as a collaboration with Tony Friel, the first member of the fall to, detect, to, to defect from the band. By 1980, every single member of the original group had been replaced, except for Marquis Smith. Kay Carroll, a psychiatric nurse who befriended Una Baines, started going out with Smith, then took on a job of managing the band. The power dynamics shifted. It became a bit of a Yoko and Lennon scenario, stated Martin Branner. The girlfriend affirming his genius. That, the girl, yes, the girlfriend of Freddie James. Tony left first. He felt he'd invested a lot of time in the fall. He had come up with the name and was, he was the only proper musician in the band. Baines went next for the, same, for the very different reason, a mental breakdown triggered in part by the druggy lifestyle she was leading. I was 20 and had this serious illness. It took me 12 months before I get to, pe get to speak to people again. Drummer Carl Burns lasted until the end of 1978 and Brammer stuck it out until April 1979. What initially started out as a collective became a dictatorship, he says. Mark's a genius, but he made it very hard for me to work with him. The breakup wasn't so much about the music, though. It was more how we were being treated as people on a daily basis. According to Baines, Smith recruited his new, his new fall from the group's roadies, who had already had a band of their own and were pliable. A word from Mark could decimate them, says Rough Trade's Jeff Travis, who produced the Fool's third studio album, Grotesque, after the Gram. They loved him, but were a bit awed. I remember sitting in a cafe with him and saying, don't you think it's really weird, Mark, that none of the bands speak to you? One of his sayings was, musicians are the lowest form of life. I can't say I disagree with him. 
with Smith literally calling the tune The Fall Embarked upon their most intensely creative period, recording a series of visionary albums and numerous brilliant singles, first for Rough Trade and then for Camera. As 1980 progressed, they drew level with Joy Division in their race to become Manchester's leading post-punk band, scoring two indie number one albums, Total's Turns, a sort of live grave hits, and Grotesque, and two indie number two singles, How I Wrote Elastic Man and Totally Wired. Grotesque offered a modern-day hallucinatory equivalent to Hogarth's caricatures of the English lower classes taking their pleasures. An idea pursued further on such singles as Lie Dream of the Casino Soul, a critique of the Northern Soul scene, and I'm Into CB. Sorry, On Into... Start again. On I'm Into CB, for instance, Smith method acts the role of a hapless radio ham, codename Happy Harry, who still lives with his parents. Quote, my father's not bad, really. He got me these wires and bits. Apart from that, he talks to me hardly. For the enemy is Barney Hoskins. This era of fall music, bookended by grotesque and the mini LP slates, threw the listener into the deranged, quote, wastelands of st sound without themes, messages or politics. These records were politics, living conjurations of the crass and the grotesque in northern pro life. What the Fool's music implied was that the whole bastion of comfortable working class traditions, the institutions of barbiturates, boozing and bingo could be transformed, could even transform themselves into a deep cultural revolution. Smith had broached this notion in, his, in the sleeve, lo sleeve notes to Total's turns, alluding to the northern circuit of working men's clubs where the Fool played early on for lack of other opportunities. He speculated wildly. Maybe one day a northern soul sound, a northern sound will emerge, not tied to that death circuit attitude or merely reiterating movements based in the capital. This, fant this fantasy scenario inspired Grotesque's epic closing track, the NWRA, which stands for North Will Rise Again. It's just like a sort of document of a revolution that could happen, like somebody writing a book about what would have happened, what, have, what would have happened if the Nazis had invaded Britain, Smith told the enemy. Around this time, Smith coined the imaginary genre country and northern to distance the fall from self-consciously innovative groups like the pop group. We are very, we are a very retrogressive band in a lot of ways, he declared. But even as the Fool's music seemed to become, the, become more hillbilly and primitive and raw, Smith, Smith's lyrics became even more intractably abstract. A frankly avant-garde torrent of found text, the British tabloids were a favourite source of inanities, spliced with his own encrypted utterances. The logoria spilled onto the Fool's record sleeves, daubed with handwritten mini-rants and nomic slant, slogans, cartoons and doodles. Through the sleeves, scribblings and songs like Second Dark Age, you could follow a fractured running narrative concerning the, art, the ex cabaret artist Roman Total and his secret agent's son, Joe. Joe. Total, said Smith, was an underground being cursed with mystical insight. He also had tentacles, which is why he had to go underground. It's like his face started leaking, Smith explained. The singer cultivated this mystical element to counter the prevailing but outmoded image of the fall as being all about industrial decay and doll cues. I am a dreamer sort of I am a dreamer sort of person and I resent being associated with realist bands. Along with the speed and shrooms, tales of cosmic horror fueled Smith's dreams. The short story genre was pioneered by 19th century gentlemen occultists like M.R. James, Arthur Macken, Algernon Blackwood and H.P. Lovecraft, all Smith favourites. For a band dedicated to stripping away Rock's romantic mystifications, the four possessed a surprisingly strong streak of superstition. Smith believed he was attuned to the strange vibrations of certain places and that his writing was clairvoyant. I used to be psychic but I drank my way out of it, he quipped in 1996. Reading speed freak science fiction writer Philip K. Dick gave him concepts like precog 
and psychic time travel. The latter informed the song Wings, during which he recruits gremlins and goes back through a time lock into the 1860s. A teenage phase of bumping into ghosts while, wa out, while out walking inspired songs like Spectre vs. Rector and Elves, in which, Smith, in which Smith shrieks, the fantastic is in league against me. The culmination of the fool's fascination with the supernatural came with 1982's Hex Induction Hour, or Enduction Hour, half of which was recorded in Iceland, a country where most of the population still believes in elves. This is actually true. In a recent article, I read that 62% of the Icelandic population actually believe in, in elves. The title track of Hex Enduction Hour, Iceland, was improvised in a Reykjavik studio with lava walls, the band oozing out a drone of two-note piano cycles and banjo that sounded like a, like sitar, topped with incantations from Smith about casting runes against your self-soul. Hex is the fall at their most forbidding and primordial, on just steps sideways or just steps sways. The group's two-drummer lineup brings a new polyrhythmic tumultuousness to the band's juggernaut rhythm. Hip Priest has an almost jazz-like swing, while the guitars on Who Makes the Nazis sound like flint shards hewn from a mountain face. And in case you were wondering who makes the Nazis, it's intellectual halfwits. Ouch. Hex was a sort of kiss-off to like everything, said Smith, and they'd never topped it. But the fall continued, alternating between relatively lacklustre phases of, and periods of renewed inspiration, 1985's The Wonderful and Frightening World of resembled a pop hex induction hour, dream like an almost lovely. By then, Smith had honed the media persona that made him a perennial favourite with interviewers. The, classical, the classic British contrarian suspicion of do-gooders and improvers, a curmudgeon who scorns trendy humbug and political cants, whether it comes from left or right. His force of personality is matched only by the force of nature, that is, full music. Still going after 30 years. Now, this was published in 2005. Still going after almost 30 years, they've accumulated a body of work whose sheer size and density rival Dylan's. A body of work like a body of water, never ending and ever shifting. It's changing same, seamlessly churns up scintillating new patterns. You never step in the same river twice, they say, and so it goes with the full repetition in the music and they still haven't lost it. 